I sure yes, am. you are. Chris. Thank the good Lord. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry for Skype. I don't know what's going on. The Estonians uh, invented this great <laughs> program, but I guess <laughs> since uh, Microsoft bought them out, it uh, hasn't been performing the best. No, nah, it's uh, some type of uh, one of the wires here on the radio board is either fried, uh, fractured, or, or something going on with there. It's probably on our end because I've had some issues with the Skype uh, earlier today, and I knew it. I was putting it out of sight, out of mind until you called, and then I was like reminded of it real fast when I called for you and you weren't there. No worries. I think there's, uh, you know, you never know. There's a lot of great conversations that happen on this program. There may be some people who uh, don't want to happen. No doubt about it. Uh, hey, with that said, before we get into some of the topics that you and I had discussed uh, prior to the show uh, that you wanted to bring up uh, to our you know, viewers' attention, uh, what's going on out there over in the EU? I see you know, images and videos from Italy, from France, uh, all these people protesting uh, these vaccine passports, burning them in the middle of the street, in the plazas, uh, uh, what's the sentiment over there? You know, as uh, the government comes, uh, you know, to 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 lock you down and to to keep you out if, in fact, uh, you know, you don't get the jab. Yeah, it's been um, it's been interesting. It's happening a lot, mostly in France. France has probably had the strongest uh, protest, but you have seen them as well in Spain and Italy, and a little bit in Greece. And it, it really comes down to what the governments are prepared to do and what they'd like to do and really require private businesses to do. And I think that's really the most problematic part. And I, I've been uh, in this pandemic now, have traveled uh, between the U.S. and Europe and seen the differences. And for me, Joe, if I want to go get a cappuccino down the street and sit down, uh, I need to show them something that's called any of the three Gs. So I need to show them either, number one, that I have a negative test, number two, that I have a medical certificate showing that I've recently... Uh, come over and recovered from COVID, or that I have proof of vaccination. So that's called the 3G method. It's what really is the case here in Austria. So uh, this little vaccine booklet, I guess, is my vaccine passport. Um, it's very strange to do this. Obviously not the case in the U.S. where we have, I think, a much uh, much more trust-based system and uh, would pretty much be anathema if uh, any business asked for your medical uh, certificates but it, it really is, um, yeah, this is what the politicians are trying to do. And we kind of warned many months ago that as soon as people had these powers, if they have the power to shut down businesses, now they're going to have the power to restrict who can enter businesses. And I think that's, that's very problematic. Where is the agency here for small businesses? You know, where is the ability for small businesses themselves to choose who they want to serve, who they want coming in the door? I think many of them would much rather brave the risk of some type of COVID transmission with all the mitigation measures they can put in than to have their businesses closed. So I think they can do that. Unfortunately, what we see in many parts of Europe, and we're seeing this increasingly in the more liberal parts of the U.S., they are requiring uh, so much of this either vaccine uh, passports and sometimes even just that. Um, it, I'm, I'm seeing in San Francisco and New York, you know, you can't even just do the negative test anymore. So I, I think it's problematic. I know uh, many people view Europeans as a more docile, uh, sort of socialistic peoples. Uh, but I can assure you, people do care about their liberties here, and they surely don't want to be stopped from doing something if they believe that they can take on the risk. And with that said, uh, you know, we had a guest on yesterday, and maybe uh, you know, she was a little further down the slippery slope uh, than maybe where you and I are right now. But she brought up this idea, and it's practiced in places like uh, communist China, uh, of all places, this idea of a social credit score. And, uh, you know, while we're not there yet, uh, you know, have you ever find, uh, can you give us an example of government rolling back uh, their emergency powers, uh, you know, in the history of, uh, you know, rule over people around the world? Well, I wouldn't make for a good radio joke because there would be crickets. Um, <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately not. I mean, we have seen some cases in the United Kingdom throughout the 1980s. You did see some powers uh, that were distributed and that were devolved. Uh, but usually most of the time, particularly when we talk about bureaucracies, especially health bureaucracies, uh, they're very, very reluctant to give up power. And I think this is what is, is happening, certainly at the CDC. Uh, they've kind of become this new all-encompassing force in our society when really they're they're not supposed to just set what the laws and the rules are. They're supposed to advise the executive branch. And then that advisement is taken under by the executive branch, by the president, by the agencies. 
and then essentially they figure out what they can do under the Constitution. And what we have now is kind of a pernicious system where Joe Biden is saying, follow the science. The CDC is somehow supposed to be science, which is not true. It's an institution. Science is a process. It's something that we learn. It's something that we test. It's something that we learn from different countries, from different experiments. And unfortunately, now they've got a lot of power. And I know you've discussed the eviction moratorium, which is hurting a lot of of people who own vacation homes, uh, people who own second homes, uh, people who have tenants who, you know, none of these people necessarily are at risk for some huge contagion um, if they are asked to pay rent. But that's really how it's being framed. And it's it's pretty unfortunate because there are a lot of immigrants. There are a lot of entrepreneurs who've saved up money to buy apartments and rent them out. And just because of the CDC's mandate and because of the willy-nilly uh, nature and no one following the Constitution in D.C., this stuff just carries on. Yael yeah, Lasowski with the Consumer Choice Center with us here this morning. And we wouldn't be in this place, of course, if it wasn't for you know the virus and the reaction to that and how it's you know created a, a big mess, not only here in the States, but all around the world. And, well, even your World Health Organization that you, in fact, you know, show so much love for over the course of the our conversations and, uh, you know, in the many years prior to, you know, us developing this partnership and relationship, uh, you've been following the ins and outs of uh, the who, uh, mostly the outs, uh, as far as, you know, calling it to attention, the waste, fraud, abuse, uh, overspending, the lavish lifestyles of those who belong to this organization and for what, uh, for efforts globally to ban sugary drinks and vape uh, pens, uh, rather than looking at, uh, you know, the potential for, well, uh, viral infection to shut down the world, uh, the World Health Organization. They say, it says it right in the name, uh, Yael. And now they're even saying, "Hey, you know, China, why don't you open the books here and let's uh, uh, let's take a peek as to you know where the hell all this came from." And we've been making this case probably for the last five years, Joe. The idea that you have a global health organization, an institution, and they spend their time worrying about how much alcohol you drink, which video games you play and what vape pen you have in your hand, it just shows that they went too far. And they go down this route of the non-communicable diseases, meaning any of these uh, lifestyle choices that people have. And they've been focusing on that a lot. And they put a lot of money into it. They receive a lot of money from Michael Bloomberg to kind of prop up their campaigns and to actually give grants to governments around the world so that they can implement these rules all the while neglecting the very important part of stopping pandemics from happening, to stop an epidemic from becoming a pandemic. And what we've seen in the last couple of days, this one really took me aback. It was almost a spit take, Joe. The, uh, the Danish head of the World Health Organization team that went into Wuhan earlier this year, uh, he actually came out in his own country in Denmark And he said, hey, look, guys, uh, we actually should be researching exactly what happened in Wuhan. And there is a lab in particular that I'm looking at because it's a lab that is owned by the the sort of Wuhan authorities, uh, local CDC, their local kind of disease control organization. And isn't it weird? They relocated their lab on essentially the same week where the first case was found. It was the 2nd of December 2019. And he said... There's something really going on here because they moved the lab, it disturbed a lot, and then from that moment on in that exact part of the world, we just happen to unleash this virus that goes around the world. Uh, so that means that there are people even within the World Health Organization, and you know these are probably the smart doctors who focus on the uh, pandemics and not necessarily what kind of uh, vape pen you got in your hand, uh, but it shows that there's you know the, the walls are beginning to crumble. And why it's important to bring this up, of course, is because when we're talking about who is responsible, when we're talking about measures to counter it, it makes a big deal if it's something that came out of a lab versus something that evolved from nature. It's a big deal because it means that if it came out of a lab, where are we going to be able to stop this the next time? What measures are we putting into place to make sure that it won't happen again? And can we even trust the people who led us astray for over a year and a half saying there's no way it could happen. Uh, I've gotten way too used to saving 
uh, newspaper articles, Joe. Uh, I'm probably like that guy in the, the Mel Gibson's conspiracy theory uh, movie with all the the little newspaper clippings and and all the the red string, because everything that we've seen in the last year and a half, if all this lab leak stuff aims to be true, well, half of it was bogus, and you really have to wonder then what are these restrictions based on? What are the cycle count numbers based on? I know you've talked about that before, and how can we get out of this? Because many of us. Look, we have a life to lead. We got things to do. Well, we can't just sit and cower in our homes forever. As we uh, move this conversation forward, yeah, yeah, okay, and yeah, we're living our best lives. Uh, if Bo is going to have his six O party here at Martha's Vineyard, and uh, you know, welcoming everybody, if we're going to have Lollapalooza or Sturgis, uh, you know, I'm going to go to the Outer Banks with my family this weekend, and there's nothing you could do about it. How about that, yeah, Yelisowski? No, oh, that's fine. You you go ahead and do that, Joe. I I've, I've, uh, would love to join you out there. Outer banks are beautiful. Would love to go out fishing or lay in the sun. Uh, Lord knows I need it. No, no doubt. Uh, make sure you bring that fifty, uh, you know, sunscreen there with yourself. Maybe seventy five for that, uh, you know, pasty skin you got. Oh yeah, French Canadian skin is, does not uh, fare well in the summer, but I do very well in the winter. Got a lot of body hairs to cover that up. Hey, yeah, yell. Uh, you know, I'm the guy at this point where you know I'm starting to draw treasure maps in my backyard. Slowly but surely, pulling my money out of the bank account, putting it in the old tin can, and burying it in certain areas. Uh, you are investing in cryptocurrency, and now what do you know? The government wants to come after you and your investments in this. You know, more of a popular form of currency that has taken the world by storm. And in this infrastructure bill that caught a lot of attention this week, well, what do you know? Uh, they want to tax you now. Uh, go figure. Uh, give us the latest on that, uh, given that I'm not necessarily versed on all of the cryptocurrency news of the day the way you are. I think the easiest way to look at this is that what cryptocurrencies represent are competition to that greenback U.S. dollar that you hold in your hand. And you might not be able to travel and see what the prices are of the dollar are when you actually transfer it to another currency. I happen to see it every day. <laughs> and what we see is that the dollar value, the actual value and what it's worth has been going down for around a hundred years. And it's gone up more at a rapid pace lately. And that means that if you are saving money in your account and you just have your account there, you're ready for retirement. If you put away $200,000, it really might only be worth $150,000 after inflation. And that's why people have been looking at cryptocurrencies for a long time. There are different ways that you can monetize value. There are different ways that you can have savings. And there are all types of new products that are revolving an entirely new industry that are providing value for people. That's number one. Number two, we have this infrastructure bill that's discussed and uh, we talked about how people are going to pay for it. And in the provision, they say we're going to step up all of the tax measures on people trading cryptocurrencies. And what they did in the bill is they kept it so broad that they really meant that anyone who touches any type of transaction of any cryptocurrency, whether on their computer, uh, there are different nodes, meaning people running things on their computer, anyone who touches anything supposedly needs to file a form with how much money they're making, with uh, all of the names and the tax IDs. It would make everything completely ridiculous. And there was an amendment to try to get rid of this and to try to shape the language, make it a bit more neutral. And it went up. You know, you don't really get interested in what's happening in the Senate too often. But I watched it live. You had uh, the amendment gone up. Richard Shelby from Alabama, the senator there, gets up. Uh, he wants to add his own modification, saying that we need to add $60 billion uh, for the Defense Department. And basically from there, Bernie Sanders got up and he said he didn't want it. And with all of that, basically, that means the amendment went away. So as far as we know right now, uh, there is an upcoming tax on cryptocurrencies. It's definitely going to be devastating for a lot of different companies that are providing value. And it's going to make it harder for ordinary people who are just learning about this technology as an alternative to things like the U.S. dollar. They're going to have less of an opportunity and more transaction cost in order to get into it. And that's very problematic because when we're looking at what the, the government is doing now in terms of printing trillions of dollars, it means the value of what you hold in your bank account is going down every day. And with those interest rates, you know, at historic lows, we hear it all the time, uh, that means that your cash is not getting any better. 
So why not switch over to crypto? Why not get a little bit interested? Unfortunately, the U.S. Senate and this infrastructure bill headed to the House uh, is not really going to help promote that. And catching some of the cliff, uh, cliff notes and commentary you know, from that conversation with some of our lawmakers, it kind of reminded me of uh, you know these committee meetings uh, that they've had over the course of the last g- couple of years in regards to big tech, and you've got uh, you know uh, career politicians, you know, in many cases in their 60s, 70s, sometimes 80s, who have been you know uh, and have spent their entire adult life inside the Beltway as an elected official, you know, patting their pockets uh, this way or that way, and then they have like the uh, millennial uh, or uh, you know uh, teenage uh, staffer and intern, you know, whispering in their ear uh, to uh, present questions to the uh, Zuckerbergs uh, and the Dorseys of the world when they're trying to clamp down on big tech. These people have no idea what they're talking about is what I'm getting at. No, you're, you're exactly right. And you know, unfortunately, this is what happens when you have great innovative new technologies that come up and people want to figure out how to regulate them. But when they say regulate, they don't mean regulate as make sure that there's no fraud or make sure that you know nobody's getting ripped off. They care only about getting revenue. It's all about the money. It's all about taxes. It has nothing to do with how it actually delivers value to people like you and me and everything to do with how much the government can get a cut of. It's the same reason they went after Uber. It's the same reason they go after Airbnb. They look at the big company. They look at the billions of dollars and say, we want a cut of that. And when they see things like Bitcoin or they see things like Ether and all these other coins going up, I mean, Bitcoin itself has a market capitalization now that's $685 billion dollars. Like, that's the market that exists for this, these types of currencies. And, of course, what they want to do is crack down, get a piece of that, and then they can go home to their constituents and say that they brought them, you know, new parks, new roadways, uh, new jobs, you know, at some center, putting together parts for some military aircraft. It's unfortunate that that's what government is. It's all this kind of bribing game to get more money and more money and then over-deliver or under-promise to so many other communities. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Uh, we're going to keep, uh, you know, pressuring them, Joe, make sure that, that people know actually what's going on and how this impacts you as a consumer, because i got to tell you, um, the only time that we can be a bit comfortable, though, is when uh, Congress is out of session or they're on vacation. Uh, that's how it's going right now, so at least i got a, a little bit of a smile on my face. Yael Lasowski with the Consumer Choice Center with us here this morning. And uh, as we wrap it up, uh, the... Uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, within the United Nations uh, delivered a, uh, well, uh, damning report to us uh, about climate change uh, this week. Uh, Yael basically saying the sky has fallen, it's irreversible, and, uh, you know, if uh, we only uh, continue to uh, push, uh, you know, electric vehicles, will the world be saved? Uh, I'm going to the Outer Banks, a little strand, uh, essentially a sandbar uh, off of the coast of North Carolina this weekend. Uh, I can recall two uh, instances where, you know, I felt that, all right, well, while the planet may very well and is, uh, you know, warming, uh, that uh, a friend of mine has a home in basically an area that is the smallest sliver of land uh, in Duck, North Carolina, where uh, the Albemarle Sound and uh, the Atlantic Ocean meet. There's like a half mile of uh, sand in between there. That's where his house is, and it's been there for 65 years. Uh, then I took a, a tour up into Kerala, where the wild horses are at, and was informed by uh, our tour guide that, uh, well, the big sand dune we were looking at right there, 50 years ago, that sand dune was about three miles to the north, in that the weather changed, the tides moved, and uh, you know, out in the middle of the ocean, well, there's weather, and it changes, and it impacts uh, you know, our way of life, and uh, is, am I going you know, too far down the way of denying? I'm not denying climate change. I'm just stating that uh, you know, there is climate, there is weather, there is atmosphere. It changes uh, how much we impact uh, it. Well, uh, I'm not really sure right now. Uh, should we uh, believe all these doomsday scenarios that they continue to tell us in what has become a, a cult, a kind of a religious type of uh, you know, feeling for many out there? I mean, you have young people, Yael, not to go on a tangent here, young people telling us that this is the biggest concern that they face in the world right now, uh, given where they are, uh, you know, living in, with their $1,000 phones and their you know, luxury apartments, uh, spending $45,000 on college. Uh, climate change is their biggest concern. It is true that the climate is changing. It is true that we as humans have impact. But the failure of many of of the people who write these reports, and what a surprise, another United Nations organization that uh, kind of fails. What they don't take into consideration is that we are incredibly great 
at mitigation and adaptation. And, you know, you, you had uh, earlier in this segment, you have Cape Fear Home Builders Association. These guys know how to build homes. They know how to build retaining walls. They know how to protect properties that come with erosion or it comes with flooding. That's something that engineers have devised. And what the a lot of the reports do by the IPCC and the UN is they just look at what, you know, total humanity and just say, look, we're totally screwed. We've got 12, 15 years left and then that's it. Well, you have to define that. You have to really try to make it so that people understand what that means and show confidence in human beings and our ability to innovate. You know, once we see that insurance cost for uh, all property that is near the water is just totally astronomical and exorbitant, I think we can discuss it and I think we can have measures to do that. But if you look at a country like the Netherlands, this place has been below sea level for 200 years. Uh, they're still living. They're still surviving. They've been able to come up with technology to protect them. I don't think that we're just going to, you know, throw the towel in and everything's done. Right. We've got we've got plenty of, of amazing, innovative, smart people who are coming up with solutions any day. We should look to these people. We should not look to the politicians who want to put carbon taxes on, who want to make your way of living more expensive, because that's not where we're going to find solutions. All of those measures and someone good you can read on that is Bjorn Lomborg. He's a Danish political scientist. All of these measures that are put up are only going to make poor people poor and going to make you poor as well. It's not going to do anything to solve uh, the problem. It's just going to move some money around and make it so that it's more expensive to live. We saw what happened with the yellow vests in France when they try to put in these carbon taxes. I think there are going to be more people who rise up once they see the actual cost of energy, the actual cost of food, and uh, all this will be thrown in the face. I'm all in on human beings and the human race. I think we're great innovators. I definitely have more positive uh, belief in our species than uh, many of these folks. The Global Grassroots Movement for Consumer Choice. Uh, Yael Lasowski and David Clement uh, host uh, the Consumer Choice radio show tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, uh, here on the Big Talker FM. Yael will also be filling in for us uh, this time next week uh, as your guide uh, for three hours uh, here on the Big Talker FM as we take a little hiatus uh, to go uh, with the fam up in the Outer Banks. Uh, Yael, as always, it's a pleasure. Thanks again for filling in ahead of time this time next week, and we look forward to a conversation coming up a couple of Fridays from today. Man, big shoes, big shoes. All right, thanks so much, Joe. Good friend uh, Yael Osowski with the Consumer Choice Center with us here this morning on the Big Talker FM.